Hello everyone and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host Gary Kerwin and on today's episode I have Dr. Chris Masterjohn. Chris obtained his PhD in Nutritional Sciences from the University of Connecticut. He has worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Illinois and also as an Associate Professor of Health and Nutrition Sciences at Brooklyn College. He has now started his own career as a solopreneur at, um, what, what's your um, website again? Sorry Chris, I've gotten it offhand. It's chrismasterjohnphd.com. So that's his solopreneur uh, website, and I'll get all these links um, for you in the show notes. But Chris, I just want to say thanks for, so much for coming on today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. So um, I'm glad I got you on because I've been following you for quite a few years, um, ever since I sort of started my journey into w the world of fats and cholesterol and uh, low carb and just the whole biohacking route down that way. So um, cause years ago, you were quite famous for helping to dispel the myths about cholesterol. Um, so that's how I I, I got onto your information. I've been following you ever since. Um, but I wanted to know. Um, so uh, we mentioned I mentioned the about the cholesterol. Um, you're not so much in that world anymore, are you? With the cholesterol, or do you still sort of try promote the, um, the information that you you learnt about cholesterol? I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, as, as a matter of principle and personality, I tend to work on something until I feel like I'm done with it and move on. So I do engage with that in the sense that if someone wants me to talk about that, I will, or my consulting clients want to talk about that, I'll help them with that. But I don't write about it that much or produce new content about it all that much. Uh, I do have some, you know, I have my podcast, Mastering Nutrition. I do have a couple of episodes relating to cholesterol, but it's not the main thing that I focus on anymore simply because there's only so much that can be said about it. Yeah. And there's I'll, time, time, time to figure out other things, you know. <laughs> I can imagine so. And uh, I mean, when you're in the world of uh, nutritional science, then there's so many avenues to explore, not just the one. And uh, it, it, I mean, at that time already, yeah, you educated me to um, to a great level just listening to what you shared back then. Thanks. Um, so you were also uh, back in that that time frame. You were doing a lot of work with uh, Western A Price, uh, the Western A Price Foundation, and the sort of paleo movement. Are you still involved in that too? Yeah, in fact, I just got back from the annual conference of the Western A Price Foundation just uh, about a week ago. Okay, and how was it? It was good. I gave two hour and a half presentations in one all day class. So I pretty much spent the entire time working. So, <laughs> wow. so it, everything went well, but I'm glad it's over. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lot of lecturing to do and a lot of content to come up with. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, that gets me on to sort of my next question really is um, because you were, well, from my understanding, you were you were quite involved with the paleo community. Is that still sort of your preferential diet for just the general person? Uh, I don't have a preferential diet for the general person. I think that diet is, so, I mean, diet is the food you eat, right? So I don't really think in terms of a diet or the diet, those kind of, those concepts don't really interest me that much. I think people need to eat food and they need to eat the food that's most nourishing to them. Uh, I guess for a lot of people, you know, having some kind of template, call it paleo or call it Weston A. Price or whatever you want to call it can be helpful. But um, I mean, at the, at the level that I engage with people, I just try to teach people what good nutrition is. And if people are consulting with me and, and want me to help individualize things for them, then it's kind of beyond the degree of having a simple template and into the degree of actually looking at the particulars, in which case the template no longer makes any use. But, you know, I mean, even even on the level of uh, the content that I produce that's really simple and aimed at a fairly large audience where like in my Chris Master John Light videos, I make short practical tips a few minutes uh, for each video, and that's aimed at a fairly big audience. Um, 
or my podcast hits a fairly big audience, you know, compared to a lot of the other things that I do. And even those are all aimed at uh, finding a particular solution to a particular problem. So I really think the default is you should eat whole foods, not a lot of junk, try to eat fairly nose to tail ish, meaning if you eat animal products, don't just eat the meat, but try to utilize the other parts of the animal, organ meats, bones, skin, etc. Eat a lot of vegetables, eat a lot of greens, and diversify the starches that you eat. Don't just eat all grains, for example, but eat from a broader array of foods. Don't unnecessarily restrict things unless you need to. I don't know what you call that, but that would be my default. And then everything from there is okay, you do that. Now you have a particular problem or a particular goal. How do you solve that problem? How do you meet that goal? That's a very individual thing. Yeah. So yeah, you're not pigeonholing yourself into a particular dietary framework um, where I guess a lot of people will be more, say, ketogenic or paleo or something like that. Whereas you, you're coming in and saying, right, so okay, just as you said, here's the general rules, but then we can customize no matter what what's, uh, is going on in your health situation. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Yeah, okay, fantastic. So, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that means, as you said, with the, the content that you produce on your podcast or the videos <clears throat> and on your website, that um, you're educating people, I guess, about lots of – about individual nutrients just to give them general information. I can think of uh, one particular post I read um, about your vitamin K post where you just you explained a lot about just that one vitamin. Um, and then you're just giving lots of other little hints and tips too. Is that, is that about correct? What, the, the sort of um, the route that you're going at the moment? Sounds right to me. Okay, cool. Um, so reading more about your story, as I said, you know, I've... Um, been following you since 2012 and um i read recently that you happened to go through a mold toxicity um problem personally yourself um are you okay maybe explaining a little bit more about that because uh, i think it would be interesting to educate people about the what is a mold toxicity um and like how you actually figured out you have a mold toxicity issue yeah, well, this started in the beginning of this year, around January or so, where the initial thing that happened was I started sleeping in my living room on my couch. And the reason was that I really needed to be 65 degrees or a little lower in order to fall asleep well at night. And I was living in an apartment where I had a fire escape in my bedroom window, and so I couldn't legally put an air conditioner there and I was cooling my room with a large AC that was in the other room and it you know every once in a while it just wouldn't get cool enough and I'd lay there in bed for an hour and then realize that it wasn't going to get cool enough and then I'd move myself into the living room so I figured why not just preempt this by just sleeping in the living room and uh, around that time and that wasn't the only thing that changed that was also the time when I quit my job and I started my own business uh, that's when I started making a lot of YouTube videos. So there's a few things going on there. Uh, but my health really started to take a turn for the worst. And I developed uh, a fungal infection in my skin that uh, took me a while to realize what it was. And it got really bad. Um, and I, th that was actually the main thing. I, I developed some respiratory symptoms and, and stuff as well. Um, but it was over the course of uh, trying to treat that and figure that out that I thought, you know, I was tr trying to think to myself, why had my health suddenly started to decline out of nowhere? And at first, it was kind of easy for me to chalk it up to the stress of just having quit my job and started my own business because that was the most obvious thing. But then I realized that I was sleeping under an AC that was blowing over a windowsill that had really badly chipping paint. And so I thought, maybe I'm inhaling paint dust and this paint has lead in it. <laughs> so I actually uh, was trying to look for lead poisoning and I measured my blood levels of lead, which were fine. 
And because it was cheap to do so, I measured all of the toxic metals in my hair and my urine. And the lead was normal in all those, but my barium was elevated 17 times the upper limit, which was pretty significant. Uh, around that time, in trying to treat the fungal infection, I went on oral terbinafine, also known as Lamisil. And around the time that I did that, I developed some twitching problems that were really bad, but were really responsive to a high potassium diet. And I pretty much cured my, I wouldn't say cured, I pretty much had the twitching problems under complete management if I avoided any carbonated water, if I completely avoided grains, and if I ate uh, probably six to I, probably I was eating five to eight grams of potassium per day in my diet. Um, and at that point, uh, I was blaming everything on the barium because the barium's principal mode of toxicity is to interfere with potassium function. And so I, it just lined up with that symptom really well. And so I went to see an environmental medicine doctor to try to figure out a plan to get rid of the barium. And that's when she reviewed my symptoms and suggested that there might be a mold issue. And I had some mold inspectors come and it turned out that uh, in addition to the real barium issue, I also had pretty bad mold problems in like underneath my floorboards and inside my walls and stuff like that. And so uh, I wound up moving out of my apartment because that's the <laughs> really the best way to get rid of a mold problem. Yeah, you got to get away um, from it. It's yeah, a distance yeah, yeah. thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, so that's that's how that story unfolded. I'm happy to elaborate on any parts of that if you want to go further into it. But that's the basics. Yeah, because I'm guessing that's the hard part with um, mold toxicity is the diagnostic part, right? To figure out that that is what I'm suffering because I'm. I'm guessing um, there's no set standard blood work test or imaging test or something that someone can go, boom, that's what you've got. Is that right? Well, there's a bunch of tests, but none of them are without controversy and none of them are, you know, widely agreed upon outside the tiny handful of people trying to deal with household mold problems. Hmm. So there's so the urinary tests for mycotoxins, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but those are controversial because everyone has mycotoxins present in their urine because there's normal levels of mycotoxins present in the diet. So it's like, where do you draw the diagnostic threshold to determine that that's a problem beyond the normal excretion? And there's, because no one is doing that outside of some environmental medicine docs who work on household mold exposure, there's no clear reference ranges set by anyone except the people who make that test <laughs> right so it's it's like it's it's sort of like if you you know every every everyone who treats anyone has their own specialty and they view their patients through the lens of that specialty so if you have someone who works on mold all the time they're more likely to see mold. Mm -hmm. If you have someone who works on thyroid issues all the time, they're more likely to see everything from the perspective of you probably have a thyroid issue that's, that's you know, you, they could look at the same case and one person says, well, you probably have a mold issue that's hurting your thyroid gland. And another person says, well, you probably have a hypothyroidism that's making you more vulnerable to infections and making it more difficult for you to detoxify things. And so that that's why you have a mold issue. <laughs> like, you know, it, so it's, it's, it's really, it's really, uh, there's no good way to navigate that. Uh, you just, you just have to find someone that you trust, try their approach and see what you get out of it is my view. I mean, I know that getting out of my apartment proved to be acutely beneficial for me. Like I, I was developing pretty significant brain fog that I mostly realized in retrospect when I spent more time outside of my apartment. Um, 
you know, just to, to see the degree to which my cognitive function improved by not being there. So uh, I mean, the, the fact that my health improved so significantly from getting out of that place, I think is good enough evidence for me. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that, yeah. Yeah, so in that way, <clears throat> the distance factor getting away from the area with the mold is sort of like a diagnostic test in itself because if you feel better leaving that environment, then there's something in that environment potentially that needs to be investigated. Yeah, presumably, of course. I mean, it's highly vulnerable to the power of suggestion, so mm. you can't discount that. But I mean, at some point, you need to make a decision based on the available evidence that you have and a huge chunk of that has to be your personal experience. Yeah, because also the symptoms, like you had specific symptoms, but not everyone who has exposure to toxic mold is going to develop the, the same symptoms. It, it's so varied, right? Yeah. And, you know, there's, so there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of possible symptoms because you can have, um, you can have an infection of the mold and that's one thing you can have toxicity from the mold. That's something else. And you can have, uh, an allergy to the mold and that's something else. And those can intersect. So you could have, uh, some of the mold toxins are immunosuppressive. So, you could get a secondary infection of something else because of the immunosuppressive effects of a mold toxin. Uh, and your body's inflammatory response could cause secondary symptoms from that inflammation. So it's quite a grab bag of different possible outcomes. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, that's, I, I haven't researched mold toxicity much myself. You know, I just sort of know a little bit about the, the topic, but from what I can, what I know of from, from an outsider is that yeah it's so varied and that's what w would make the not only the diagnosis but then i don't know even the s some of the the long-term treatment options um quite difficult would it well i think the best long-term treatment option if you actually know that you have an indoor mold issue is to is to move out of the place uh i think that's really effective the problem is what do you do if you own the house or what do you do if you have a family that lives there? Uh, what do you do if you don't have enough liquid emergency savings to move when you want? There's like, that's where things get difficult. Mm. So that when you said that you had the, um, the, the people, the specialists come in to measure the levels of levels of mold. Is that pretty um, accepted when they say we found mold, then um, it's just a no go. That's, that's bad for your health. I wouldn't say that because different people have different capacities to deal with those kinds of problems. But I think you're, I mean, I, it's not, you don't rely on any one piece of evidence. You try to fit the evidence together. Mm -hmm. So I was having significant symptoms that were relieved from leaving. And I did have water damage and I did have uh, mycotoxins and I did have species of mold that you would attribute those types of things too. So it's really the totality of the evidence corroborating each other. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, you know, I'll say that that actually makes me somewhat dismissive of the urinary mycotoxins because I had two classes of mycotoxins in my urine that weren't found in my apartment. And I had one class of mycotoxins that was found in my apartment that wasn't found in my urine. So, um, so I actually... I, I'm actually extremely skeptical that the urinary mycotoxin screen was useful, and it's really the corroboration of the other things that's of interest to me. Yeah, but well, it, again, it's it's complicated too, right? Because you, you, the so the the types of mycotoxins that were found in the dust at my apartment were trichothecenes, and trichothecenes are immunosuppressive, and some of the some of the uh, species of mold that were found in my apartment. Uh, are not do not make toxins but do cause infections right so it's entirely possible that i had uh 
that I had exposure to trichothecenes that suppressed my immune system and made me vulnerable to getting infected by one of those species of mold that might have otherwise been fairly harmless if my immune system was um, up, uh, up, up to bat. Mm. And that, uh, then, you know, then that caused various symptoms from the infection, you know, and, and maybe the mycotoxins were just from food, right? <laughs> uh, you know, or the mycotoxins were made by something that was, that was actually infecting me. Like it, there's, there's two, the variety of different possibilities is too broad to, really rule out anything on one piece of evidence, right? Like like to look at the lack of corroboration between the urinary mycotoxins and the dust mycotoxins just uh it doesn't really tell us anything except the story is a little bit more complicated than the simplest version. Mm -hmm. And it sounds to me then um thinking of sort of um you know in, in medicine it's sensitivity and specificity uh, looking at uh, testing and um yeah that the ur urinary test might just say maybe there's an issue but we can't say that there definitely is an issue because it's too weak of a test um and as you said you have to add in all the other factors around that to try come up with a bigger picture well i mean what you want to really do is uh, if you're going to talk about what's a sensitive and specific biomarker you'd have to do a lot of research that has never been done mm. and the research that you would have to do is I mean, first of all, you'd have to be able to to define the disorder you're trying to get the biomarker for in a very uh, clear way that that you know someone who's not you will agree upon. Because what you'd have to do is you'd have to say, well, let's measure these biomarkers in the urine, and then can we find a cutoff point where um, we have a very low risk of missing someone who does have mold toxicity and we have a very low risk of falsely identifying someone as having mold toxicity when they don't. But in order to do that, you actually have to define the cases of mold toxicity or else how are you going to study whether it's a, whether it's sensitive and specific biomarker for that condition. And the only way I can think of to do that is to div is to design, you know, the the appropriate treatment protocols around that, and determine whether people get better with those. But I mean, like, think of what it would be like to try to conduct that study, mm -hmm. especially if the treatment is moving out of your apartment or remediating it with fifty thousand dollars. Like, you like you you so you you take this random sample of people. And you measure all these different urinary mycotoxins, and then you take, uh, and then you then you take all those people and you randomize them to moving out of their house or not, to going through various detoxification protocols or not, and then you see who gets better and who doesn't, and then you try to define the urinary threshold that predicts <laughs> that response. Like I, I don't see that study getting done anytime soon. And there's not enough money in that route to do that. Well, also, but also, like you know, who, I, like who's going to volunteer to submit to that? I mean, unless you're going to pay for them, unless you're going to pay them a lot of money to cover the expense of moving yeah. or remediating, and then some <laughs> to deal with the hassle, yeah. right? Like that's uh, that that study's not getting done anytime soon. Yeah. So I, I guess um, what I'm tr trying to come um, just to help listeners come up to a point is if they believe they may have a mold toxicity issue, just the beginning part is the diagnostic part. And then having for someone like yourself, who's um, quite educated in this and has also gone through it personally now, like your sort of advice to someone um, to, to figure that sort of the first step, the diagnostic part is... Um, is what I'm. I'm trying to also pull pull a little bit more information out here. Well, I, I don't. I. I mean, I'm not going to paint myself as an expert in even finding the right person because uh, I just don't know enough. But I would say you want to work with someone who has that as their expertise. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, I can't give any. I can't give any advice on how to find that person, though. Yeah, yeah, they have to uh, do a little bit of searching and networking and just word of mouth speak to other people and so 
some of the, the urinary tests were di- diagnosed and then the, the symptoms. And so in your case, how, uh, how, how soon after sort of that realization that um, you're dealing with a mold issue, did you get to leave your apartment? Did you have to still stay there for a period of time? Because uh, I'm guessing the trauma there would be thinking, all right, so I'm told that there's a problem in this apartment, but I have to sleep here tonight or I have to sleep here for the next few weeks or months or whatever. And then you become emotionally stressed thinking I'm making myself sicker. I moved right away. Um, but so, so one thing that I had noticed before I had the mold inspection was that the twitching symptoms that I was getting were much worse when I would be on my couch, even during the daytime, if I would sit on my couch and I started, I started sleeping entirely in my bedroom, but even, even leading up to prior to, to the mold inspection, I started try, basically spending all my time in my bedroom because I just noticed that my symptoms were a lot, were a, a, a lot calmer when I spent all my time in my bedroom versus my living room. And it turned out that the biggest mold problem was in my bathroom wall on the on the other side of the wall that the couch was up against in the living room. And that wall was actually like before we did any before we did any sampling, the first thing that the mold inspector noticed was that on the bathroom side, the shower wall was was outwardly bulging. Like if you looked at it at the right angle, you could see that it was that it was bulging outward from a, like from accumulating water damage that was pushing it out. And there was mold that was seeping out, black mold that was seeping out from where the wall met the tub. And I, you know, I. I I talked through like what I do after my shower with the squeegee and with this and that. And I'm like, what else should I be doing? And he's like, you're doing way more to control water damage in your bathroom than anyone, like almost anyone else I talked to. And this has nothing to do with surface water uh, because the mold is not growing on the surface. Like that mold is actually seeping out from inside the wall. And the, 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 in a, in a standard wall, the the pores, the microscopic pores are bigger than mycotoxins. So the inspector thought that it was highly plausible that mycotoxins were leaking out of the wall on the other side and and getting on the couch. And couch, you know, couches are kind of squishy, right? Anything that's anything that has a foamy uh, absorptive kind of uh, material is going to act as a sponge for mycotoxins. And so uh, I never proved that, right? It would have been really expensive to take samples of the couch and take samples of each thing to test them for mycotoxins. So I didn't do that. But the way that that lined up with what I was intuitively doing when I had no basis for like, I didn't have a, th- I had no theory that, that, that would make the couch any more likely as a source of mycotoxins than anything else. I just intuitively felt that my symptoms were best when I avoided the couch. Um, and so the fact that, that that theory lined up with my intuitive experience was a basis for me to accept it as an actionable reality. I mean, you, there's no, like, it would have been it would have been more costly for me to try to prove every detail of those things than to ju- not only costly with money but costly with time too because when you're running your own business the more time you spend making decisions about what furniture to keep and where to live and how to clean whatever like that's that you know that's uh you're losing, you're losing your business, right? Like, so I had, I had to, I, for me, I had to make the decision based not only what was an out of a pocket expense, but also what was going to save me time and not hurt my business revenue. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, uh, 
my lease my lease was almost up and it just i mean i could acutely feel how much getting out of the apartment was benefiting my own uh cognition but there were reasons i wanted to move out of that apartment anyway that would have led me to move when my lease was up. So I, I basically just moved a month and a half earlier than I probably would have anyway. Okay, and it so. kind of got me off my butt to find a place. And it just made much more sense for me to move as fast as possible and to uh, just make decisions faster than to try to extend things or save things. So that, I threw that couch out. <laughs> yeah, uh, well definitely <laughs> you wouldn't want to take um i guess that's you know when you when you've been in a place with mold toxicity there's potentially quite a quite a bit you might need to throw away just because as you mentioned they're absorptive and they're going to be growing potential growing areas for the mold and it gets stuck in there it's a little bit like um smoke damage after a fire and you have to throw things out because the smoke just gets absorbed by lots of different materials like curtains and uh, sofas and anything and you just got to throw it away yeah i threw away pretty much anything that had an absorb an absorptive surface so mm -hmm. i threw away my mattress i kept my bed frame for example mm -hmm. and i think you brought up some great points too about with um when you were thinking uh when you were speaking with the the re remediation or the mold toxicity um inspector saying how um how you were trying to keep water away in the shower or like a wet space like that and that they're saying you know the great tip is it's not just the water that you see and yes you can take it all away but actually it's i would say i'm guessing that a lot of the time with uh, mold tux mold growth it's it's because of what we can't see what's happening inside the walls around the pipes and the fixtures um so it's not it's not that it's not like it's our fault for not having got rid of the water away fast enough that we can visually see. Yeah, it's a it's a building construction issue, mm. and or at least it often is, and it was in my case. Yeah, and that's from the stories that I've heard with people who suffer. It's you know it's a leaking pipe pipe somewhere, so it's it is it's uh, as you said more of a construction issue. Um, but I'm interested to know then. So you, you left the apartment on the least. Um, a, le a leased apartment, so a rental. D does the landlord have to then do something to fix that before someone can move in again? Or I'm, I wonder, how does that work? Uh, they they wouldn't. Um, so I, you know, I told them about it and kind of left it at that. Wow. Okay. So that's interesting again to know that it's like this problem can just continue because of the way the system works with um, apartments too, that these la uh, potentially landlords don't have to remediate these. Um, well, these in, things, in theory, in, th in theory, they, they do, but uh, in theory they do, but in practice they won't because they're, they're, uh, they're because there's, there's no law that requires any kind of third party certification that the remediation was done correctly. So if an inspector identifies a mold problem and develops a remediation plan, it's then in the landlord's court or the you know the owner slash management company's court to remediate that, which they can do themselves. And so um, the likely scenario is that they're going to choose to do it themselves and cut a lot of corners. Mm. Wow. Okay. Well, I think this is just good informa information for, um, yeah, for people to know. <clears throat> and um, so now uh, that's got me on to thinking, so you moved out the apartment. Um, what else would be sort of the typical treatment plan that someone would have to go through in this situation like you did? I don't know. I would ask that question of an environmental medicine doctor who deals with it. I actually haven't really followed up on treating anything apart from moving. Oh, right. Okay. So there's, um, because I was also then, um, this has got me more onto now where I was reading your story about how you changed your, your diet and what you, you ate, um, supplements, I guess. And as you've, you've alighted us already too, is that your potassium strategy for the, the twitching. Um, 
but actually, just before we get onto that, um, with the um, the barium, um, where where does that come from? Well, at least two sources of barium were the paint chips themselves and also the makeup powder that I was using to shoot my videos. So when I record videos, I apply some, uh, you know, a matte foundation mm -hmm. and some bronzer to get rid of the glare from the lighting. And uh, the makeup that I was using had barium in it. Wow. So, so potentially it was those two roots that were cr creating those abnormal levels in you. Yeah. Well, again, good for, good for people to know that uh, when you're, you're trying to be uh, professional and, you know, produce uh, professional videos, but um, the materials as simple as just using the makeup is uh, potentially going to cause some issues for you. Well, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And I think I you think don't use that, that anymore in your videos, do you? Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm using a different makeup and I'm having a friend apply the makeup who's, uh, got some skills at it. I don't think men should apply makeup to themselves because I think they're more likely to inhale more of it. <laughs> I wouldn't have a clue how to even start. Um, I've done a little bit of TV and I know when you sit down and they have to do everything, it's yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a different skill set that, um, so yeah, the, I, I just I just think that I'm I made more of a mess with it because I mean A, I, I didn't know what I was doing, and B, I had a really cheap kabuki brush. <laughs> um so with your your journey then after your sickness, uh like with your diet then, what what did what did you found made the best difference for you in your personal case? Well, I tried a few things. So one of the things that I tried doing was chelating the barium with EDTA. Uh, and and when I measured the minerals in my hair, I also got the nutritional metals. And so I, I started supplementing with everything that was low in my hair to protect against mineral deficiencies from the EDTA. But my hair zinc was high, so I wasn't supplementing with zinc, and I think I actually gave myself a zinc deficiency from doing that. So I don't really recommend it. <laughs> um, and I, and I, I, also, I also haven't followed up with the barium testing. I plan to do that in a couple of months. Um, so I, I'd like to see if I, if I move the, the... I mean, I may have moved the needle on barium just from cutting out the exposures to it, but, uh, but I, I also don't know if the chelation did anything for it or not. Mm -hmm. I live in New York and it's hard to run tests on myself in New York. So it's something that is way easier where if I'm visiting my family, I can just do a bunch of testing when I'm out of, outside of New York state. Cause there's more, uh, more New York is one of a small handful of states that prevents direct to consumer lab testing All right. um so it's 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 something like if i'm visiting my family i can just run a bunch of tests then so probably if, when i'm visiting my family for christmas is when i'll do a lot of follow-up testing mm -hmm. um i also i also spent some time taking activated charcoal and uh and sulforaphane to try to detox the mycotoxins and i also put myself on a low mycotoxin diet at that time and i don't really feel like that did anything for me so i cut out cheese and some other stuff on that basis and i feel like it was mostly a waste of time and uh and again i like i'm i'm not even sure if the urinary mycotoxin screen was e useful in the first place and that's the only thing that i would retest to see if any of that did anything and uh but i i, I kind of, my more or less just abandoned it because i didn't think it was really moving the needle mm -hmm. much so um i i think the the two things that really did move the needle for me in a really big way w a, apart from eating a potassium rich diet was zinc supplementation and well, I should say adding zinc to the other minerals that I was taking. Um, zinc and vitamin A made really big improvements uh, and also bicarbonate supplementation to try to 
uh, uh, optim to try to optimize my urine pH made a enormous difference in my vulnerability to the twitching episodes. Uh, so th that the the bicarbonate started when I got the results of a plasma amino acid analysis back that showed that my glutamate was really high and my glutamine was really low and one of the things that you do in response to an acid load problem is that you break apart glutamine to form glutamate and ammonia and you use the ammonia to buffer the acid and uh, the enzyme that does that in the kidney is is primarily regulated by ph and it and one of the things that I realized symptomatically early on was that although about 80% of the twitching problem was eliminated by eating a lot of potassium, the, uh, the other 20% was relieved by avoiding anything acidic. So in the, worst, before, in the worst case scenario, I was not eating a lot of potassium and I would have like, there was this one time where I ate a frozen pizza and drank a bottle of carbonated water and it made the twitching go utterly berserk wow. and and when i cut out the, the i don't think the grains in the pizza really did anything i think that they just displaced all the dietary potassium because i could have eaten a bunch of potatoes for example instead of those grains and i would have gotten a lot of potassium so it was a really low potassium meal, and I had, and the bottle of carbonated water put a lot of that acid load into the system. So I already knew there was something with with needing to avoid acids. And so when I saw the results of the plasma amino acid analysis, and I was talking through all of this with a friend, uh, everything just sort of came together where I realized that everything was fundamentally an acid base problem. And so what I did was I started measuring my urine pH all the time, and it was it was constantly in the uh it was constantly five or under i i actually had to buy new ph strips that went lower than 5.5 the first time i did it because it was running so low wow. and um you you really want your urine ph to be in the mid sixes most of the time you know it might you might wake up and it runs a little bit acidic but um but anyway the, the other thing was I my workout tolerance at this time was really poor. So I'd lost a lot of lean mass. I wasn't working out. And I had recently tr tried to start working out, but I I would I'd do one full body workout. And even though I designed my workout to try to minimize the amount of metabolic stress it put on my body by taking a lot a lot of rest between sets, for example, I'd still get back and I'd just be knocked out and need to lie in bed for three hours. And then it would take me five days to recover from my workout. And when I started testing my urine pH, I realized that my workouts were creating an acid load that basically just completely floored me. And when I first started experimenting with bicarbonate, I took a quarter teaspoon of bicarbonate before I worked out. And my urine pH still tanked to under five when I got back. I was I was conked out in bed and I kept waking, like I kept getting out of bed and taking more bicarbonate. And every time I'd pee, I'd measure my urine pH. And I wound up taking a quarter teaspoon of bicarbonate three or four times with no movement in, in my urine pH above five, which is really crazy. And there was... At some point, I took some more bicarbonate and I lied down for a little bit, and then all of a sudden, I popped out of out of bed with a lot of energy and really wanted to start working uh, for the first time all day. And I went and measured my urine pH, and it was six. And so it was this really dramatic illustration that as soon as I took enough bicarbonate to move myself out of the acid pit that I had that my workout had landed me in, all of a sudden, my energy was back to normal. Wow. So I so I started measuring my you know I took hundreds of urine pH measurements and I calibrated the dose of bicarb this is regular baking soda I'm taking sodium bicarbonate um, Arm and Hammer you know dollar forty nine uh, a box like cheap stuff uh, so I calibrated the dose and timing so that I was basically just taking the the dose uh, twice a day in a way that kept my urine pH stable. And so my program, which 
I wouldn't advocate for anyone else. This was derived from my own data about what normalized my urine pH. But on my on my rest days, I'd take a quarter teaspoon of bicarbonate twice a day. Uh, I think it was 12 hours apart. I'd have to go back and look. Um, and then on my workout days, uh, oh, by the way, so I'm taking this uh, far away from food. You never want to take bicarbonate with your food because the alkaline effect on your stomach will hurt your digestion and the acid effect from the food will make you turn the bicarbonate into carbon dioxide, burp it out and waste it. So, um, so I always took this as far away from food as possible. And on, on my workout days, I would get up and I'd take a half a teaspoon of bicarbonate. I'd wait 30 minutes then I'd have some coffee, I'd have some breakfast, then I'd wait at least 30 minutes, uh, possibly an hour, and then I'd go do my workout. I'd bring uh, a bottle of water with a, an extra half teaspoon of bicarbonate in it that I would drink while I was doing my workout. I'd front load it so that it was the first water that I drank because there's a pretty significant delay in the alkalizing effect of bicarbonate for me. It's different for everyone, but for me, there's a hours delay before it changes my urine pH. So I'd be drinking. So basically, the bicarbonate that I took when I got up is the main thing that was buffering acid during my workout, and the uh, bicarbonate during the early part of my workout is mainly buffering the post-workout acid load. Um, and then that changed everything. I started being able to work out five or six days a week no post-workout crash, no extended recovery period needed. Um, and that, so that, that bicarbonate was, the, was, apart from moving out of my apartment, the bicarbonate was the first big game changer for me. And it, it, it completely changed the twitching symptoms. So before I started the bicarbonate, I could not, I still could not drink carbonated water and my twitching response was really severe to alcohol. So my limit of for how much wine I could drink without getting twitching symptoms was two to three sips. Wow. That's two to three sips of wine before I'd get twitching symptoms from it. After the bicarbonate, my tolerance for alcohol improved to the equivalent of three full glasses of wine before I would get any twitching symptoms from it. It was like a night and day difference. And, um, and then the, the, the next game changer for me was, uh, was zinc and vitamin A. So when I started putting on muscle mass, I recognized a handful of symptoms that looked to me like zinc deficiency. And uh, one of them was I was getting dry skin uh, as I started to put on muscle mass. And that's the earliest symptom of zinc deficiency. And so I began to think maybe I'm zinc deficient. So I started taking zinc, but then I, as soon as I could, I went and measured my plasma zinc. I actually had to take a train into Connecticut to measure my plasma zinc. Um, but anyway, uh, m even after three days of supplementing zinc, my, my plasma zinc came back uh, borderline clinically deficient at this time. But one of the things that I noticed immediately upon zinc supplementation was as soon as I started adding zinc, I started not needing bicarbonate on my rest days. So I, the bicarbonate still helped to buffer the acid load of my workouts, but on my rest days, when I was actively supplementing with zinc, I would get up and my urine pH would be in the high fives, and then I'd eat food. And as long as my meals weren't potassium deficient, just eating food would shoot my urine pH up into the mid to high sixes. And... That was that was really remarkable, and I, I don't know why, but I I think that a couple possibilities are that a zinc was helping me get more carbonic anhydrase activity, which is a zinc dependent enzyme that helps stabilize your pH levels, and b uh, zinc is actually really helpful for chelating heavy metals, 
And to the degree the barium might have been still an active problem, the extra zinc might have helped me chelate barium and prevent it from having toxic effects. And uh, and then around the same time, I started adding in a, a lot of uh, regular vitamin A supplementation. I think both the zinc and the vitamin A help were the were the big things that helped me uh, normalize my um, the re- the remaining dermatological symptoms that I was having because my my big early problem was a fungal infection and I had largely got it under control, but it never really it never really like completely normalized mm. until after getting the zinc and vitamin A in. So it's, those were the real game, game changers for me. Moving out by carbonate, zinc, and vitamin A. I love those biohacks, man. They, uh, <laughs> you know, to be able to do that sort of quantifying on yourself and, and see and, and then test different things and think, wow, that's actually making a big difference for me. And I'm glad you found it. So you, are you feeling much better now? Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Um, and I mean, I, I just love that information, um, especially with the urine. I would never have thought, you know, using that as such a, a, in one hand, it sounds funny that we talked about with urine, with mycotoxins being weak, but how powerful you found the pH level of your urine to be, to modify that, you know, to, uh, to give you a, a big health benefit from that. Mm. Yeah. Well, Chris, I, I know, um, unfortunately, we're running a little bit of time here and you need to shoot off. But I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your um, your personal story there because I always think when people get to share personal stories, we can learn so much more too. It just um, the, the whole um, thing about this show is um, just to give people lots of ideas and then to maybe start taking action even today. So I'm sure maybe someone listening to this who – is either got the twitching um, side effect and they th- and they're thinking maybe I should check my my urine pH or I'll try some zinc or potassium now um, or the bicarb trick that you're talking about too. Um, I think these is all these are all great um, avenues that that people can explore and I'm sure they're going to find that super helpful. Do you talk about any of of this um, on your own personal blog? Do you go t- into deeper detail in any way? Not yet. I definitely will in the future, but there's you know, I just like I, this is an incomplete story, and I'm trying to f- kind of pe- fully, fully put together all the puzzles and be able to explain everything before I really do a deep dive into it. Okay, fantastic. Well, um, for people to follow you and keep up to date when you do share this, how how can they do that? Everything's at chrismasterjohnphd.com. You can go to chrismasterjohnphd.com/newsletter to subscribe to my newsletter. Or you can find all of my content by searching or browsing through chrismasterjohnphd.com. And I'm at Chris Master John on uh, all social media. That's YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And you can search Mastering Nutrition in your favorite podcast app or search my name to find my Mastering Nutrition podcast. That's also on the website. Uh, and if all else fails, you can just Google Chris Master John. <laughs> Google's pretty good at that. They're, they're, they'll find you <laughs> that's right yeah well again thank you so much for sharing all of that and i will put all these links in the show notes on your episode page awesome thanks gary mm-hmm.